Hello, BookTube. Once again, gruesome, boring matters called me to downtown Boston at an ungodly hour this morning, uh, taking the subway that early. <laughs> oh my, <laughs> oh my. I am pleased to report in this, these outings that uh, uh, virtually everybody that I saw was wearing a mask and keeping their distance from each other. So there's at least that. But uh, once again, I decided to reward myself <laughs> when uh, when the early morning's business was over by going to the Brattle Bookshop, which for the 70 people who are new to this channel is a used bookstore in the heart of Boston. It's three stories. They are wonderful, wonder wonderfully stocked stories full of reasonably priced books. The third, the third floor is more unreasonably priced books because it's the antiques and collectibles floor. So that if you have a book fancier and you think a, a rare book would be the perfect gift, that's where you'd want to go. And the staff will open that floor for you if you ask them to. Uh, it doesn't stay open just for random foot traffic, obviously. <laughs> or unless if there's nobody up there, they don't leave it open and leave you in there with the collectibles. Uh, but this, the staff will not only uh, unlock that third floor for you, but they'll offer you advice if you have a book fancier and you yourself are not one and you'd like to, you think that a rare or collectible volume might make a good present might hit a bullseye. Maybe you need to hit a bullseye. Maybe it's a new relative or an in-law or a boss or somebody. I'm sure that the staff would be willing to help if somebody's there and knows anything about them. Uh, I myself never venture up onto the third floor. <laughs> I never do. I might be dragged up there if my long, my lifetime ambition now is to have Jason Harrigan over from Ireland. Jason has a channel here on BookTube, Byways in Brooklyn, and he is a book collector and, an, and a knowledgeable, a knowledgeable, an authority on, on certain kinds of collectible books and my the dream in my life now is to have him and mark richardson from richardson reads also has a booktube channel to have them over together to boston and all three of us go to the brattle and then the world never sees us again. <laughs> uh, and that that dream i i can't help but think that that dream was close to happening i mean Mar mark is a library director jason's uh bibliographic, you know, antiquarian journeys sometimes took him to America, and I have nothing at all to do. I am not even wearing pants. <laughs> it would have, I feel certain it would have been possible, it would have happened if not for this pandemic, but uh, as it is, who knows if that dream will ever happen. But the, the in addition to the, 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 the bookstore, with that third floor and then two stories of ordinary used books, just in profusion. There's also a sale lot right next door to the Brattle uh, that is thousands more books. Thousands more books in all kinds of subjects, in all kinds of formats. I would say in all kinds of conditions, but the Brattle tends to be fairly good about what's out there. It's not junk. You're not getting rain-damaged, moldy stuff like you get on the outside barrows of certain other used bookstores that I could mention, uh, who have far fewer outside carts and they tend to be discarded junk so you go on a buy you buy the books that you're interested in and then the person says well could you take these and you do but you put them outside and you leave them outside in the rain and the sleet and the snow the the brattle outside lot is not like that at all you can find books out there that are indistinguishable from new uh, as well as books that have been clearly well loved and they are all over the map in terms of subject matter and uh I have gone to the Brattle, to the sale lot and the indoor store for a long, long time. <laughs> for a long, long time. Longer than all of the employees there have been alive. Uh, and I love it. I dearly love it. I love it not only as any bookworm would, but also for its ability to take your mind off pretty much anything. I've gone to the Brattle sale lot when my heart was broken, having lost a, a dog. It, and I, I would go there before I would go back to work, before I would go back to social events or circles of any kind, just to be around my old friends, the books. Just to be having that silent conversation with them. And although those were some of the only times I've ever been to the Brattle where I didn't buy anything, because I, I couldn't bear the idea of talking to humans inside. You have to go inside the shop to pay for the cards that you pick out outside, and I, I couldn't bear that, so I would just wander around. But that, I believe it helped in healing. Uh, and. I didn't, I didn't particularly need any healing today. All I had to do was keep it snappy because I'd already been away from my little schnauzer for as long as she is willing to allow. But I did get a stack of books. 
and I want to show them to you. And the, one of the one of the yardsticks, uh, not so much of books at the Brattle, but when you carry a book on you, I always have a book. I have hundreds of books on my phone, but I also have I always carry a printed book in my bag. Always carry a printed book in my bag, uh, just in case. You never know. It may be that you pull out your phone and your your ebooks don't load for some reason even though they're on your phone instead of in the cloud it could be you never know whereas there's nothing at all unpredictable about a book a printed book that it that's why that technology has existed for so long because there's nothing uh up in the air about it it will always work exactly as it did before what are you doing oh is that just a piece of cardboard oh it is okay all right go ahead <laughs> she's she's such a handful over on her bed there <laughs> I heard her tearing at that, and I feared the worst. Oh, and now that I've talked about it, she seems disinterested in it. Oh. <laughs> I tell ya. I tell ya. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Uh, what I, the point I was trying to make is that there's an acid test. One of many. There's an acid test if for the book that you have in your bag, that I have in my bag. It's the only game in town on the ride in to Boston. It's not a long ride. I could just stare at the walls, but I don't. I read, of course. I read all the time. And it's the only game in town going in. But it is a, a litmus test, an acid test of that book about how much you want to get back to it, even on the ride back, when you have a bag full of new goodies. And i got to confess, today, I really wanted to get back to my bag book, which is a murder mystery. It's a Catherine Aired murder mystery. It's called Some Die Eloquent. I, isn't that cover wonderful? I am absolutely sure I have read this before. But like so many murder mysteries, I don't remember. And I'm a well way in now. Uh, but I started this morning. I'm, I'm well way in. But I'm not remembering. <laughs> I'm not remembering the details as a woman uh, who is found dead. And... Uh, she had been diabetic and her condition had been worsening and her local doctor has been telling people well yeah it was only a matter of time uh, but Detective Inspector Sloan is called in and as he's nosing around he realizes uh, two things <laughs> one uh, there is absolutely no sign of foul play on the body and two uh, the woman was not what she appeared. She appeared to be a fairly down-at-heels pensioner. In fact, her own relatives at the beginning of the book, when he talks to her, her next of kin, who is her executor, the executor says, yeah, well, I don't imagine it'll be very tough to divvy up her, her life savings because she never had any money. She was a poor pensioner. But it turns out she has a quarter of a million pounds in the bank. And Sloan and his superior want to know what that is. They want to know the reason for that. Simple as that. That is how this whole murder mystery starts. It doesn't start with any kind of bang or a gunshot or someone running across, or, you know, jumping the garden fence or anything like that. It just starts that way. That a woman dies, apparently of natural causes, but she has a quarter of a million pounds in the bank. And no one anywhere around does. So? <laughs> I love that. Absolutely love it. And I was reading this when I got to Downtown Crossing just as the woman's dog who had gone missing the night before she was found dead, the dog is found. And uh, the, a friend of the woman had complained that the dog was missing, and that and neighbors had said that they heard her calling for the dog late into the night. Uh, Isolde is the name of the dog, because it's a Tony neighborhood. And when, when uh, Sloan's assistant calls him and tells him that they found the dog, Sloan says, was it an Airedale? And the, the assistant says, yeah. And Sloan says, well, is it her dog? Does it answer the name of, of Isolde? And the assistant says, not anymore. It's dead. Somebody slit the dog's throat. It's not that I get hit by a car. Somebody slit its throat and buried it in the woman's garden. And that, that I confess, I had a bag load of goodies on the way back, but I could not resist reading more. That is just terrific. That is just terrific. The dog's throat was cut. <laughs> and uh, Sloan's superior, uh, a gruff kind of imbecile, says that it has just mentioned to him, just as I stopped reading, has just mentioned to him that the flip side of love me, love my dog is hate me, hate my dog. So 
who knows? Who knows what will happen? But so, so Catherine Aird <laughs> does no wrong. Every time I read one of this woman's mysteries, I end up loving it, no matter how many times. I feel certain that by the time I get to, the, there'll be a big reveal in Catherine Aird novels. There's always a big reveal at the halfway point to keep you from nodding off over your tea. <laughs> uh, and I feel certain that the big reveal at the halfway point of this book will remind me of everything else. That all, all of a sudden, the mists will part. And I'll remember not only all the details about how the novel continues and ends, but I'll also, which is, I confess, at my age a little more interesting, remember where I was when I read it last. And all those memories will come flooding back. I'm certain that will happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So for right now, at least, on the train ride in and the train ride back, I'm having the joy of reading a new Catherine Aird mystery, which I didn't think was ever going to happen. Uh, but the books I got are, are not uh, chicken feed, by any means. They are not insulted by the fact that a, a gripping murder mystery was keeping me away from them. And it's a mixed lot, including some murder mysteries. So I thought we'd, I thought we'd go through it together now that I am done with my... my uh, long preamble here. Uh, the first murder mystery is set in Ireland in 1981 during uh, during the Thatcher crackdown. The whole country about to burst open at the seams. This is Adrian McKinty, whose books I just love. I read, the first book of his that I read was called Dead I Well May Be, and I thought it was just incredible. Just incredibly good. Bitter, raw, eloquent, modern, gritty detective fiction very much like um the rebus novels only i think a little bit uh just a tiny bit sunnier it's not a word you'd use for adrian mckinty but a tiny bit sunnier than the rebus novels and less self-pitying i can't stand the self-pity that runs through the rebus novels but anyway this is uh the cold cold ground uh which if knowing adrian mckinty probably refers to some sort of folk song or something like that but of course i can't help but think of the tasmanian devil <laughs> from the bugs bunny cartoons life or do you bury me in the cold cold ground <laughs> i can't help but think of the tasmanian devil i'm sorry <laughs> uh, this is let me let me read you a bit this is the spring yeah spring 1981 amid the chaos sean duffy a young witty catholic detective in the almost entirely protestant royal ulster constabulary is trying to track down a serial killer who's targeting gay men as a Catholic policeman, Duffy is suspected by both sides, and there are other layers of complications. For one thing, homosexuality is illegal in Northern Ireland in 1981. Uh, then he discovers that one of the victims was involved in the IRA, but was last seen discussing business with someone from the Protestant Ulster Volunteer Force. <laughs> so this is going to be murder, scandal, and politics. I, and I, I, don't, I haven't read this book, but I know already I love this author. So unless my luck gave me his one bad apple, I'm going to enjoy the heck out of this. And the other one was also a murder mystery. And it, unlike uh, in the cold, cold ground, this is just a shot in the dark. The prices of the battle are so reasonable that you can take a shot in the dark. Many of them, if you want to. You could go to the outside carts. The outside carts are sale carts. $1, $3, and $5 sale carts. Meaning if you stick to $1 books, you can spend $20 for 20 books. You can get a bag load of books for $20. Uh, and more to the point, since even a $5 book is just a $5 book, and you spend a lot more than that every day, uh, usually, especially when you're going to work and coming from work, you can take shots in the dark. I have gone to the Brattle sale lot many a time with someone who just ended up buying uh, on a whim, just half a dozen books that they'd never heard of, that they knew nothing about at all. They just kind of liked the feel of it. Who knows how many reading adventures the Brattle has sparked, has sparked uh, with, with, because of that, because it's an affordable place to go and, fi and find books. And this was affordable. I know nothing about it at all, but I will gladly give it a try. It's another murder mystery. It's called Bats in the Belfry uh, by E.C.R. Lorak, part of the British Library Crime Classics. Bats in the Belfry. Uh... Let's see here. Bruce Addleton dazzled London's literary scene with his first two novels, but his early promise did not bear fruit. His wife, Sibylla, is a glittering actress, unforgiving of Bruce's failure, and, a couple, and the couple lead separate lives in their house at Regent's Park. When Bruce is called away on a sudden trip to Paris, he vanishes completely until his suitcase and passport are found in a sinister artist's studio, The Belfry, in a crumbling house in Notting Hill. Inspector MacDonald must uncover Bruce's secrets 
and find out the identity of his mysterious blackmailer. This intricate mystery from a classic writer is set in a superbly evoked London of the 1930s. And since the wife's name is Sibylla, she will be the villain. She will be the one who did it. Uh, but anyway, E.C.R. Lorak was the pen name of Edith Carolyn Rivet, who lived from 1894 to 1958 who was a prolific writer of crime fiction from the 1930s to the 1950s and a member of the prestigious Detection Club. Uh, her books have been almost entirely neglected since her death, but deserve rediscovery and fine examples of British, classic British crime fiction in the Golden Age. Okay, well, I'm reading Catherine Aird, so this is, this is not that great a departure, and it's another murder mystery, so it's fine by me. Uh, then this next one is a, a paperback, and it's got fairly cheap paper and fairly weak binding. I will reinforce it, but it reminded me, as soon as I saw it, I realized I didn't have a copy and that I really want to reread it. But it reminded me that I don't have a nice solid hardcover or an ebook of this, and I should. I really should. This is uh, The Eye of the Story by the great Eudora Welty. There she is. At home. <laughs> there she is, at home. Very hard to find a picture of Eudora Welty when she is not at home. <laughs> but uh, this is a big, generous collection of her nonfiction. So, tons and tons of book reviews, but also large, long essays on particular authors. The uh, The title of the collection comes from a long essay on Catherine Ann Porter. Uh, but there's also plenty of essays on other people. And a large collection of essays on the craft of writing. Uh, some of which are famous on their own. Some of which have been anthologized a million times. And because it's the brattle, I found this outside for a dollar. So I grabbed it. Because it's, you know, even if I don't reinforce, I will reinforce it, but even if I didn't, and even if it fell apart immediately, it's still only a dollar. It's wasted. And that's not wasted if you can read it as you go along. But because it's the Brattle, I knew they'd have a huge selection of Eudora Wealthy on the inside, not in the, in the bargain lot. So I went in, because I was trying to refresh my memory on the Library of, the Library of America, did, did a beautiful slipcase volume of some nonfiction from Eudora Welty, and I was wondering if the whole eye of the story was maybe in that volume. In which case, I would upgrade. I would gladly have just not got this and bought that instead, so that it was, you know, because those are much better books, just physically. Uh, so I did what I imagine a lot of people do at the Brattle. I brought this book inside, brought it to the Eudora Welty section of fiction, found a copy of that Library of America box volume, took it out, opened it, and was just comparing the two tables of contents. And this has an enormous amount more. I, I, that's kind of strange to me. It's kind of strange to me that... that uh, but it, there has, there's some over, there was some overlap in the two volumes, but this has an enormous amount more. And this, because it has tons of books, uh, tons of essays on writing and tons of essays on, uh, that are on authors, including actual book reviews, it will go in here. It'll go on the the, uh, the bookcases there that I have for collected book essays, book prefaces, and book reviews. So, and to add Eudora Welty there is a treat, a decided treat. I admit, Eudora Welty was on my mind because uh, there's a reprint coming, a really nice reprint coming of her book, One Writer's Beginnings. Uh, I'm blanking right now on who is doing the reprint, but one way or another, uh, I have been approached uh, by the publicist to see if I want a copy, and I do, and... Uh, I'm going to try to see if somebody will let me review it. That I mean, other than... I, I, for those of you who are new, I am a, a, the editor of uh, Open Letters Review, which is an online literary journal that's been around in one form or another for a long time. And I can write reviews there of anything I want, provided it's new. Uh, but there's an extra thrill to some other editor letting you reach their audience to write about a certain book you want to do. It's a long shot because book section editors are fighting tooth and nail for space. They can't cover even, a, even except for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, nobody can cover even a fraction of what they want to, uh, of all the books they want to. And so a reprint volume is going to be tough. That's going to be a tough pitch to make. I will try. I will try, but... Uh, but one way or another, that Eudora Welty was on my mind. If I'd seen, I think the other day I saw a really nice hardcover copy of One Writer's Beginnings at Brattle. And I, I kind of had in the back of my head, I don't shop for things there. Because if I do, you won't find anything. I won't find anything. It goes against the grain of the karma there to shop for things. But I, I, in the back of my mind, I kind of had, well, you know, if you see that, you know, you pass on it once, but you do want it. Because I don't have a copy of One Writer's Beginnings. And 
I might might be nice to read it ahead of time and also to read the introduction, the foreword, the preface, whatever ancillary material attached to the last nice hardcover reprint, which this was. It'd be nice to know about that before I write a review of the new one, even if I don't use it, even if I don't use that knowledge, even if it'd be just nice to know. Uh, so she was kind of on my mind. I didn't expect to find this. This is, of course, much better than for me, because for, <laughs> I also am a book reviewer. And when it comes to this particular author, we have a couple of other commonalities as well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say we both we both knew the streets and back streets and the suburbs and the moods of Iowa City very well. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Uh, this next one is uh, an anthology. It's about books and reading. It will almost certainly come in here. I've had it so many times. I've had this book so many times. I always give it away. I always give away copies of it to people because it's, it's an eminently easy thing to give away to a book lover. Uh, it's called Bookworms. Uh, and it's edited by Laura Furman and Eleanor Standard. Uh, and it's it's just, it's got, uh, this is by, who did this? Carolyn Graff. It's got uh, French flaps. And it's just tons and tons of excerpts from every author under the sun about every aspect of reading and readers and books. Just a, a one of those, I'm sure that you've seen this. I've seen it many, many times. I've gotten many copies from the Brattle. Uh, Laura Furman, uh, <laughs> we again there is a tiny commonality <laughs> let's just let's just say she and i both knew every single street every single curbstone every single shop every single mood of austin texas for nearly 30 years she taught at the university of texas at austin and i lived in austin for a little while and so so but, but these the selections in here are fantastic they never go on for too long they're precisely focused so you know i don't know if you've read anthologies like this book or reading, you know, how we love reading, anthology type things like that, where the excerpt is just lazily done. It goes on forever and ever. It's talking about, you know, portobello mushrooms for five pages and books for one page. And it's it's just that the person who picked it thought, hey, I vaguely remember, uh, well, what was his name? Uh, Frank Norris wrote about books somewhere, somewhere in here, just pull the whole thing. And this book doesn't do that. This book zeroes in on exactly what it's talking about. So I will probably browse my way through this. Uh, quite a few of these things may command a lot of my attention that, uh, immediately. Uh, my brattle halls very often become TBRs. <laughs> At least in some part they do. This next one, for instance, yes, absolutely. I haven't read this in forever. In forever. This is Dover Books. Boy, though, boy, though, I wish it were bigger. This is Curiosities of Literature by Disraeli. Not Benjamin Disraeli, <laughs> but his father. Isaac Disraeli. <laughs> his father was a writer, a prolific writer. He was also an amazing bibliophile. He, 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 was, he prowled the catalogs and the, the uh, collectible book world just endlessly, endlessly, and was known, <laughs> unlike his son who was quite busy, he was known to spend literally whole days in his library and had a magnificent library, a magnificent home library that he could just withdraw into. And he wrote biographies, historical biographies, that are very, very good. Good luck finding them, but they're very, very good. Uh, they deserve to continue being read. And he wrote on a whole bunch of other subjects, but this, uh, Curiosities of Literature, was by far his most popular book. It sold like crazy. And it sold like crazy for a long time. It went everywhere. And all it is is countless stories, some at two pages, some at ten, some at fifty, of a million different aspects of the bookish world, of the author's bookish world. Collectible items, that one particular book, certain kinds of collectors, certain kinds of shops, normal books, normal book hunting, certain aspects of reading, certain aspects of being in your personal library, no matter how big or how small it is. Just delightful. Just, just like, like, uh, the, the like, the, something like this book, only written by by, I don't know, Cosabon from Middlemarch, only, or only with the literary skill of Edward Gibbon. Just an amazing, amazing book. People knew this book. Book people knew this book. It was a, an incredibly popular birthday and Christmas present. Uh, and the reason why, this is Dover, and leave it to Dover, the old Dover. The old Dover, Dover Classics is known now for 
uh, reprinting for reprinting classics at a very cheap price but once upon a time they did a lot more than that it was still reprints but it was so adventurous oh my god multiple volumes of Audubon or or the journals of Columbus multiple volumes with fold-out maps elaborate stuff amazing really they reprinted artwork they reprinted uh, books with with elaborate maps and supporting materials for very cheap but without gutting the work themselves and naturally they did this I don't think that for instance my beloved Penguin Classics I don't think they've ever cons condescended to reprint Isaac Disraeli at all I don't think they've ever reprinted even this version of Curiosities of Literature and the reason I say this version is because look at how thin this is the, the Curiosities of Literature was five times this long maybe ten times this long and there were a couple of other books that were that Disraeli wrote because this was so popular that were very much of a type. You could make a little bookish library out of the bookish and literary writings of this author. And he's very enjoyable. Where are they? Maybe Dover did a, a couple of his others. Why Dover didn't do a full version of this? The editor of this... Who edited this? Are they going to admit to it? <laughs> are they going to confess? Are they going to tell me who they are? Everett Bryler edited this, and he admits in his introduction that he, the, the, his method of, sort of, of selecting these was just personal preference. <laughs> this could have been much longer. I would have taken it at much longer. I have a feeling, again, I would have to consult with, with uh, a book antiquarian much along the lines of what Isaac Disraeli was like. I'd have to consult with one such creature to find out how affordably I could find this author. I have no idea. Maybe it's more possible than I think. Maybe nobody cares. Maybe, you know, $15 would get me a whole set of him. Who knows? I, uh, I was happy to find this. Even a, a heavily abridged version of this is fine by me. And because the, it's heavily abridged and it's full of little segments here and there, it also is an encouragement to dipping right away, to going and sampling it right away. Quite a few of these things that I got are. are there, but uh, this next one is a murder mystery. Uh, by a wonderful author. Talk about a personal library. Oh, my. This author had a personal library, a library in his home that was stuffed to the rafters with books. Everywhere. Books everywhere. And they spilled out of that library and were all over the house. Everywhere. In every room. Mountains of books. He loved them. He read them. He collected them. And he wrote them. <laughs> Lots of them he wrote. Uh, this particular author wrote some of the best writing that still remains some that is, remains still some of the best writing on the mystery author Rex Stout also wrote books on lots of other people and he wrote a really good novel about his service in Korea uh, this is his only murder mystery he rather he rather funnily admitted at one point that every time he would have a literary gathering or a, a dinner or something of any kind readers would come up to him and say I've, I've completely lost track of the name of your murder mystery could you remind me and it happened forever and ever. And he used, to, he used to say, I finally realized that if I wanted to answer that question to all those people, I'd better write a murder mystery so that I have an answer. So he did write one uh, called The Coin of Vantage, uh, which is uh, a Boston murder mystery steeped in Boston lore of, uh, of the previous century. And that centers around the Boston Athenaeum, which is a private library uh, on Beacon Hill, uh, 10 and a half Beacon Street. Uh, that is fantastic. It's an amazing. It's an amazing place, and uh, it's it's a little bit of uh, the sign, a sign of the the author here is John McKeeler, and it's it's a little sign of his preference about the design of his book that this is the cover, because the Athenaeum is not on that cover. <laughs> that instead of the Athenaeum being on that cover, that uh, is the coin of vantage. That is the view from the fifth floor of the Athenaeum. Looking down on the burial ground on the church, and this building is still there. It looks exactly like this. The trees are a little fuller. It, that, that building is still there, but it's much bigger now because that building was torn down and built back up again about 10, 15 years ago uh, as a new uh, building for uh, Suffolk Law School. It's a rather nice looking thing, but it's it's enormous. And it looks so ponderously heavy that you wouldn't imagine that it wasn't there 10 years ago, but it wasn't. And that is the view. That is the coin of vantage, is from the fifth floor of the Athenaeum, which is one of my favorite places anywhere on earth. 
is the fifth floor of the Athenaeum. I, uh, I voted not to allow casual people up there. You, I, I voted that the only people who could use the fifth floor would be people who had an actual project in mind. I voted that no one could be allowed up there who wasn't an, an actual member. Uh, I was voted down on both of those. I voted that uh, computers, laptop computers, should not be allowed up there. I was voted down on that. <laughs> I was voted down on a lot of things. But nevertheless, the fifth floor of the Athenaeum, it's not, it's not open to non-members. I think non-members can look at the first two floors, but with a fishy eye from the clerks the whole time. But your non-members can't go any up higher in the building than that. And the fifth floor is wonderful. It is absolutely a wonderful place to spend time. Uh, I don't do it anymore because, as I mentioned in another video, I have a young, energetic dog, and I love spending time with her. Love it. And since she's young and energetic, she doesn't sleep 22 hours a day. Those days are coming. There's no way I can put them off. I would if I could. But they, those days are coming. The days are coming when she will barely notice when I come and go. Instead of doing a dervish and screaming her head off, she'll barely notice. She'll just sleep. When those days come, I may spend more time on the fifth floor of the Athenaeum or in Bates Hall, the Boston Public Library, or who knows where else. Uh, but for the time being, I couldn't do it. I couldn't possibly do it. What would I? What would be going through my head the whole time? So I bring a I bring a laptop to the fifth floor of the Athenaeum in order to work on a piece that I have on deadline for Monday. How could I possibly do that? Why would I possibly do that? No matter how much I enjoy the fifth floor of the Athenaeum, how could I possibly do that knowing that that my best friend is back here and is sort of sighing out the window waiting for me to come back. Well, I can do all of that here with her playing with my toes or just, you know, with, with me reading on the laptop while I pat her head on the top of the couch. No, there's no excuse whatsoever. Otherwise, I would. Otherwise, I very much would. Uh, and this, if I read this when it first came out, uh, <laughs> Robert Parker, Mary Higgins Clark, Jerry Healy, all, uh, all, uh, blurbing it uh, to Anne happy Easter 1988 love the big bunny rabbit <laughs> well 1988 I guess that tells me yeah 1988 I read this then I seem to remember that the murder mystery part doesn't really play a whole big element in it it's mostly a Boston novel and even more than that at its creamy center a Boston Athenaeum novel we shall see I will reread it uh, then this next one this author came up uh, on this channel just recently. I'm going to have to check and, and uh, sort of remind myself. I think I think he wrote the introduction to the Penguin Classic edition of Common Sense by Thomas Paine that I we did in the, our Daily Penguin just the other day. I think that was it. Uh, his name was rattling around in my mind and I saw this for a dollar, so I grabbed it. This is Our Lives, Our Fortunes, and Our Sacred Honor. The Forging of American Independence, 1774 to 1776. A book centering on the Declaration of Independence. And it's by Richard Beeman historian Richard Beeman, and here it is in a trade paperback. Uh, I don't think I got this when, as an advanced copy. I got it as a finished copy. Pretty sure that I reviewed it. Uh, I liked it. It's, it's very, very energetic, very, very good. Uh, but I don't think I'd ever seen it in a trade paperback before today. It's like I mentioned, I, I'm so accustomed to just waiting for books that I just wait for paperbacks and never see them. Uh, a lot of times, never see them. A lot of times, publishers don't send you the paperback. Uh, so, I uh, uh, actually, uh, John Meacham is, is blurbed on the cover. Actually, now that I mention it, am I blurbed in here? And there's no way. Philadelphia Inquirer, Books and Culture, Cleveland Plain Dealer, Kirkus Starred Review, but that was, I didn't review this for Kirkus. Uh, Publishers Weekly, Book List, The Roanoke Times, Richard Brookheiser. Very good author. Thomas Fleming, another very good author. Good Lord. Gordon Wood, son of a gun. Boy, this got the royal... <laughs> Open Letters Monthly. And it's by far the longest blurb, too. Good Lord. By far the longest... What did I have to say? The American Revolution tends to bring out the best in its chroniclers. Case in point, Richard Beeman's latest book. It's a charming, fast-paced retelling of a narrative that's been retold a thousand times before. It's not really the historian's trade he's plying in these pages, but rather the epic poets, reciting the grand old stories while the wine of patriot season flows and the night sky over Boston is filled with fireworks. 
There's a worth to that, and Beeman has written a worthy book. Okay, well, case in point, I had no idea that I'm generously blurbed on this thing. So, okay, great. Fantastic. Well, I grabbed it. I would, I would have wanted it anyway. I didn't check it ahead of time. I would have wanted it anyway, although it does underscore the question. Is there is the world ever going to know how many Steve blurbs are out there on paperbacks? I don't I don't know that they will. I don't know that they will. Uh, then this next one, this next one, I'm, I'm going to show it to you a little bashed. <laughs> I did, I did cave in and get one of these science fiction anthologies that are now in profusion at the Brattle. This is Gardner Dozois. This is the year's best science fiction. This is the tenth annual collection. I, I need about twenty of these to make all thirty-six. And I, this is this is just another brick in the wall. Uh, who who have we got here? I'm assuming. I don't have the knack that, that uh, Mark does or that Jason does to, to know right away whether or not this is a science fiction book club edition, but this hardcover seems a little small to me. Uh, and I thought, weren't they usually a little bit smaller? I don't know. I don't know if this is a science fiction book club edition or not. But let's see who we have here. Uh, Michael Swanwick. Even the Queen by Connie Willis. Really good story. Uh, Round-Eyed Barbarians by Eldest Bragg Camp. Uh... uh Dust by Greg Egan. Two Guys from the Future by Terry Bisson. The Mountains of Two Mohammed by Nancy Kress. So we have Connie Willis and Nancy Kress. Uh, let's see here. A Long Night's Vigil at the Temple by Robert Silverberg. The Hammer of God by Arthur C. Clarke. I seem to remember liking that story of Clarke more than I like most of what he writes. Uh, Ian McLeod is in here. Grown Ups. Joe Haldeman is in here. Graves. Uh, Steve Utley. Tom Maddox. Maureen McHugh. Neil Barrett. There's a Robert Reed in here. Birthday is in here. Two words. Uh, Jonathan Latham is in here. The Elvis National Theater of Okinawa. Um, Bradley Denton. Ian McDonald. Kate Wilhelm. Okay, so we have Nancy Kress, Connie Willis, and Kate Wilhelm all in one volume. Fantastic. Another Ian McLeod. And Outnumbering the Dead by Fred Pohl. Okay, there are a lot of names. That's great. There are a lot of names in here that I don't really know. I know that I read this when it came out. Uh, this would have been in the 90s. The 10th annual collection would have been... Yeah, 1992. Uh, but I I know that I must have read this when it came out, but I don't recognize a lot of those names. And that's going to be great. Because that, that these anthologies, if you've got an anthology by an, uh, uh, an editor who is passionate and knows what he's talking about, you could learn a lot of, about a lot of new authors. You could be introduced to a lot of new authors that, that you, whose work you will then want to follow up. And one of the neat things about these Gardner's Ozwa uh, anthologies is that he tended to be loyal. He was, a, he was a tough critic, even of authors that he liked. Uh, but they, many of those authors said they were writing for him. And a couple of those authors, one in particular from Boston, said, I'm not just writing for him, I'm writing up to him. In other words, I'm, I've got a draft of a story down, and it's okay, but I want Gardner to like it. I want him to really like it. And it's not, as, it's not good enough for him to really like it, so I'm writing up to him. And... I won't, it's not quid pro quo, of course. He was as objective as he could be when he assembled these books, but he rewarded that kind of effort. So the, if there are authors in here whose names I don't really know, whose works I'm not really familiar with, and I like them, chances are they will appear in other volumes. So I, will, I, I, won't, I'll have, I won't have far to go to find. Uh, then we have, uh, this is just a gorgeous hardcover edition. These things, everything by this author was brought out in this edition uh, by, who did this? Little Brown. Uh, probably about 20 years ago. I want, I want, now I want to know. It's probably much longer than that. 1998. I wasn't that far off. <laughs> this is Evelyn Waugh, and this is the complete stories. But uh, Little Brown came out with all of Waugh in editions like this. I only knew those editions in paperbacks. In fact, until I saw this today, I wasn't 100% sure that this had ever come out in hardcover. Uh, but here it is with the original artwork and the uh, deckled edges. I don't know if you Yeah, there you go. Uh, and I don't know why, I've read all of Waugh's short stories, but I don't, it's high time that I reread them. I don't know them that well. I don't know them well enough to just pass on a book like this. Uh, and this is an author who pretty much everything that he wrote I like in one way or another. So uh, I'm, I, I think this is lovely. So I grabbed it. And uh, the last book that we're dealing with is also a very, an author who's very familiar to me. I have read, I think, everything that he's written. Uh, and this edition is familiar to me too, but again, I, it visually identical, except I only remember the, seeing this in paperback. So when I saw the hardcover in exactly this format, I grabbed it, because I don't have it. 
I don't have this anywhere else, so I thought, why not? Why not go into it? This is the collected poems of W.H. Auden. A uh, nice big thick thing edited by the other Mendelssohn, <laughs> by Edward Mendelssohn. Uh, <laughs> a little private joke there. Now, don't you worry your pretty little head about it. Uh, but it's been a long time since I spent any concerted amount of time with Auden the poet. So I will do that. And like so many of these other things, the little murder mystery, uh, the curiosities of literature, uh, bookworms, uh, eye of the story, those are all anthologies of little pieces. Murder mysteries, an, an anthology of science fiction short stories, an anthology of e Evelyn Waugh short stories, like those, this also encourages getting lost by first just saying, I'm just going to dip in. I'm just going to read a couple. That's going to happen with a number of these books. The Beeman book is practically the only exception that isn't that, where I'd have to be in for the long haul. All the rest of these things are, are just calling to me. They're saying, we're not a distraction. Just a little amuse-bouche. That's all. Just come in for a couple of poems. That's all. And then you can just go right back out. And you know that's not going to happen. You know that's not going to happen. I'm going to read a couple of poems in this, in this big volume. Probably I'll read the preface too. And then I'll end up spending three hours reading these poems. Or all of the short stories of Evelyn War, or the whole of that tenth year's best science fiction. <sighs> Maybe not. Maybe I will exercise some of the, the renowned self-discipline that, <laughs> that, that, that so many people have complained about. Uh, so that is it. That was our trip to the Brattle today. Uh, it's not nearly as hot today as it has been. The, the, the worst of this massive heat wave in Boston is dissipating and is predicted to continue dissipating. There are going to be a couple of burps, I think, in the next few days of temperatures going up almost to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, but then a long trough of relief, a long trough where the temperature struggles to get up to 80 during the day, which in Fahrenheit is very forgiving. <laughs> I'm the only person in Boston who's going to miss that heat wave. <laughs> but anyway, when I next go to the Brattle, I will next take you along. <laughs> in the, although I don't need any of these books. Since the, a lot of you are being very generous by sending me ebooks by the cartload every day, and because I already have a ton of books, even so. So we have the collected poems of W. H. Auden. I will I will reinforce this cover, and then I will have this lovely edition that I remember so well. Uh, the collected short stories of Evelyn Waugh, uh, Year's Best Science Fiction, the tenth edition. Uh, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Uh, with a very nice blurb. <laughs> so that's a nice bonus. Then Coin of Vantage uh, by the late, great John McAleer, McAleer, McAleer who uh, wrote a story, wrote a murder mystery uh, set in the Boston Athenaeum. Uh, and Curiosities of Literature by Benjamin Disraeli's dad, a noted bookworm, a noted book bibliophile. Uh, then Bookworms, uh, partly edited by Laura Furman, uh, also about bookworms and all of their uh, pertinent quotes. Uh, the Eye of the Story, by the great Eudora Welty, all of her nonfiction, a little bit flimsy as a paperback, but it'll do both as a read in the moment and also as a reminder that I need a better copy. Uh, then a couple of murder mysteries to finish things out. Bats in the Belfry, uh, about a faded, a washed up mystery writer, and The Cold, Cold Ground by Adrian McKinty, set in the Ireland of 1981, during the Troubles. So, so there you go. Uh, that was my Brattle Hall, and of course, honorable mention goes to Some Die Eloquent by Catherine Aird, which I will pop right back in my bag for the next time I go out. That's the key with bag books. I just leave them there. I don't, I don't say, oh, I'm at a great, a great spot, so I'm going to take this out and read it, because it belongs in my bag. <laughs> so anyway, that is your Brattle visit for today. It was a lot of fun. It would have been a lot more fun if you'd all been with me, but in spirit anyway. So I'm going to wrap this up, but I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.